A very warm good morning and good afternoon, dear members of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to our webinar on understanding arbitration as an effective tool for dispute resolution. My name is Sabina Pandey, and I am the head of the legal department in the German Chamber of Commerce, as well as regional director of the Calcutta branch. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you in Germany and India to this webinar, and also a special welcome to our colleague, Mr. Dirk Mata from the Dusseldorf Office of indo german Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining today. Many of you uh, deal with business partners in Germany and India, and you must have faced situations where a difference of opinion emerged with your business partner. Thankfully, in most cases, companies are able to settle those issues on their own. But we also experience that many of our members have shared such concerns with us, and we have been assisting some of those companies in a quick and less formal way to our mediation procedure. Hereby, the Chamber engages with both parties to sort out misunderstandings and assist in the communication process. However, often, and especially for larger deals, this is not enough. It is advisable to have a procedure in place where both parties can refer to an authority, which offers a formal way, yet a quick way, and a fair conflict resolution. Hereby, arbitration has been very popular for international commercial disputes. Arbitration is offered by many different institutions in India and internationally, including the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. We are pleased to have with us today legal experts from the law firm Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas in Mumbai, who will explain to us what are the benefits of arbitration and how we can use it effectively for conflict resolution. It's my pleasure to introduce the two speakers now. First, we have Mrs. Shanin Parit. Shanin is the leader of the international arbitration practice at Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas in Mumbai. She has more than two decades of experience and is a qualified lawyer to practice as an advocate and solicitor in India. She is also a qualified solicitor in England and Wales. Her focus area is domestic and international arbitration, where she represented many clients in different institutions as well as ad hoc arbitrations. Shanin is a member of the Singapore International Arbitration Center and the London Court of International Arbitration. She also serves as an ambassador of the Asia Pacific Arbitration Group of the International Bar Association. As a second speaker, we welcome today Mr. Jeet Shroff. Jeet is a lawyer and he is part of the dispute resolution group with special emphasis on complex commercial litigation, international commercial arbitration, and investment arbitration. He has worked on matters such as shareholder disputes, intellectual property disputes, and construction disputes. So welcome to both of you. And I wish all of us a fruitful webinar and now hand over to Shanine for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. And uh, many thanks to the IGCC for inviting us here today. Um, unfortunately, it is human nature to have conflict. But fortunately, uh, it is our privilege to be able to help our clients in resolving these conflicts. And so we thought that with a particular focus on the Indo-German trade that we see and which is increasing year on year, it may be fruitful for you to have a broad overview of the process of arbitration with a particular focus on India as relevant to uh, our German counterparts also, because in India, arbitration is no longer treated as an alternate form of dispute resolution. When you talk of dispute resolution generally, 
the first thing you think of is litigation it is resolving a dispute in court but in india for various reasons works one of which is the length of time that it take to have legal proceedings disposed of in courts you find that arbitration has become more and more common even for purely domestic disputes between indian entities and disputes elements and that in fact the world over arbitration has become preferred norm of the sorry to interrupt sorry to interrupt shani your voice is breaking uh, uh, can you switch off your webcam good resolution so what we're going to cover today is i will touch upon gen really arbitration versus litigation particularly in the uh shani hi can you hear me uh ladies and gentlemen really really sorry for this interruption we'll uh, just just be with us on the line we'll just fix this technical error is it can you Can you hear me now? Yes, now you are audible. Sorry, thank you. I've just, I've just switched network connections, and I have uh, connected on my dongle. So then I can switch it off. I can switch it off. Apologies. The sometimes problems for from of walking from home and of course these kind of problems invariably occur when we are on webinars or in meetings can you all hear me now uh yes okay. shani we can hear you yes sorry yes. apology okay so let me come to arbitration versus litigation now why would you choose one over the other um there are some jurisdictions in the sorry just a minute my apologies in many jurisdictions across the world court litigation is almost the default form of dispute resolution and that is where the courts are quick to function they provide expeditious relief you are sure that the judges will be impartial there are some countries in the world where there is a lot of conflict and you may therefore want to avoid litigation or avoid having to go before a national court particularly in terms of cross border transactions why parties prefer arbitration is because of the party autonomy that flows from it and that is you are not assigned a case before a particular judge where you have no choice you have the ability to choose your arbitrator to choose the judge who will determine your dispute the procedure is much more flexible and is usually a lot more informal 
as opposed to the formal court procedure that is covered in a litigation. Uh, the aspect of neutrality in cross-border disputes is something that is particularly attractive to parties where they can choose an arbitrator which is of a neutral jurisdiction. So say for instance, you have a dispute between a German company and an Indian company. In an arbitration, the parties would be able to, uh, to take a tribunal with maybe an English arbitrator or a Swiss arbitrator to determine their disputes. The other thing is that there are limited grounds of challenge to an award. And this is generally both under Indian law, German law, and also most global developed jurisdictions. The grounds of challenge to an award are much more limited than it would be to the judgment in a trial court. And because of what we refer to as the New York Convention, which has been signed by about 150 parties across the globe, arbitration awards from in one territory will be recognized and enforced in another. So generally for cross-border transactions, arbitration is the default mode of dispute resolution. However, in, even in India, almost every commercial contract today will have an arbitration clause, not so much because there is a worry of any bias or anything from our courts. I have to say that our courts, at least the high courts of Delhi, uh, Calcutta, Bombay are quite sophisticated, but it is more because of the huge delay and the long system of appeals. So generally arbitration is the preferred choice. Uh, next slide, please. Very quickly, I will touch upon the difference between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. So when one chooses an arbitration clause or chooses to go to arbitration, as I said, party autonomy, which means what? that the parties have the complete autonomy to decide who will adjudicate their dispute and also the procedure that will be followed. Now an ad hoc arbitration is one where the parties and the arbitrator decide their procedure between them and they can formulate it in either which way. They, so they can decide to on the timelines in which pleadings will be filed, the order in which the statement of claim or the defense will be filed, the uh, whether the arbitration will be only on the basis of documents, the timelines for the arbitration. So that is ad hoc. It is very, very flexible. Whereas institutional arbitration, although it is flexible and it provides parties with flexibility, there are preset procedures and rules. So by and large, you know exactly how your arbitration will follow if you use these institutional rules. And at least within India, particularly within the Indian context, the preference will always be to go for institutional arbitration as opposed to ad hoc arbitration because sometimes the ad hoc arbitration can become too long winded. Whereas if you have an arbitral institution administering the arbitration, they can keep the parties and the arbitrator on course. The only place where I would suggest or not suggest, but say that uh, ad hoc arbitration may work is if the dispute is extremely simple, <coughs> the value, the claim value is low, it's before a sole arbitrator, then perhaps ad hoc arbitration may work well. But generally otherwise, in the Indian context, we would always recognize institutional arbitration. Now, some of the arbitrations which are common in India are uh, the ICC, uh, a domestic institution which is very robust and works very well is the Mumbai Center for International Arbitration. Uh, arbitration under the Singapore International Arbitration Center rules is also very common in India. I know that the uh, 
German DIS rules are also fairly robust. I myself don't have any specific experience of those rules, but there is little to choose between them and I don't think there'd be any problem in adopting those rules either. Next slide, please. Apart from arbitration, another form of dispute resolution which is picking up steam globally is mediation. Now I have written the title of the slide you will see is mediation slash conciliation. And the reason for that is that these words globally are used interchangeably. And there is very little, there are few technical differences between them, but those are more academic rather than practical. And with the kind of global recession that we see ourselves in today, particularly given the COVID pandemic and the way that it has affected several sectors and industries across the globe, this kind of amicable settlement, which is not a formal adjudication, is becoming more and more popular. Now, there are various uh, our in the Indian Code of Civil Procedure and the Arbitration Act both provide for mediation or conciliation. Importantly, our Arbitration Act, now if you see the act is called the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. And it provides that a settlement agreement that is reached through conciliation has the same effect as an arbitral award on agreed terms and it is enforceable as such. Now the reason I mention this is a practical point for you all to keep in mind is that if you all want to mediate or conciliate your disputes, it is better to use the term conciliation because you don't want a technical argument that the act says only conciliation settlement agreements are enforceable as awards. Whereas if you have an agreement that is arrived at through mediation, that may not be enforceable as an arbitral award, but you would have to enforce it by filing a separate civil suit on it, which really defeats the purpose. Where the word mediation does not matter is if, for instance, legal proceedings have already been filed and then parties decide to try and mediate their disputes, that settlement agreement can then become a decree of the court. So this is just a practical thing to keep in mind. Why it is worthwhile to consider mediation prior to a formal invocation of arbitration is because it is time and cost effective. You don't have several rounds of pleadings. You don't have witness statements. You don't have several rounds of hearings. So it's a much shorter process. Both parties collaborate and cooperate to try and come to some compromise. And where that is especially important is when you want to preserve your commercial relationship, when you want to continue to do business with your counterparty and of course this is not mandatory if parties feel that a settlement is not viable they can withdraw from the proceedings and continue with arbitration or whatever form of dispute resolution is required but it is certainly something that is worthwhile to consider particularly now when companies and businesses do not have the bandwidth or the time or the finances to go through a long drawn out arbitration process. Now, I believe the IGCC has provisions for mediation as also for arbitration. So perhaps you all can uh, reach out to them for further information on that front and they can certainly help you. Otherwise, there, is a, there are, of course, various other arbitral institutions. And should you all have any questions, we are also, of course, available. Uh, next slide, please. So very quickly to tell you the way the Arbitration and Conciliation Act is formulated. It has been modeled on the ancestral model law 
of international commercial arbitration which is also the basis on which the german arbitral regime has been modeled so there are a lot of similarities as i uh, talk you will see that there are a lot of similarities between the german regime and also the indian arbitration and conciliation act uh, the act is separated into three main parts part 1 which deals with the detailed procedure of arbitration uh, is where the arbitration is seated in india it deals also with challenges to domestic awards part 2 deals with the enforcement of foreign awards part 3 deals with conciliation next slide please <coughs> uh next we touch upon the arbitration agreement because this is extremely important it is something that you all should keep in mind at the time of actually entering into your contract now the main characteristic of an enforceable arbitration agreement is that it must be in writing this is a voluntary mechanism for settlement if you do not provide that any disputes under the contract will be settled by arbitration the default position is that the that uh, the parties will have to resolve their disputes in a court so if you do want to do uh, if you do want to resolve your disputes through arbitration it must be mentioned in your contract now when i say that it must be mentioned in your contract and that contract must be in writing there is not necessarily any specific format we it can even be a purchase order for instance you have some terms and conditions in your purchase order one of those terms and conditions if it says that disputes any disputes that arise under this purchase order shall be settled by arbitration that is sufficient to be an arbitration clause so that is something that is very important your purchase order can even for instance refer to the rules of another arbitration it can refer say it may be governed by uh, the fosfa rules or the gafta rules all of those will be references to arbitral institutions which will administer arbitration and therefore it is extremely important to mention that uh next slide please so what should your arbitration agreement include so as i said the word arbitration a simple thing saying disputes shall be referred to arbitration is sufficient to ensure that you are not sent to litigation and to a court that your disputes can be arbitrated but what is also important are a couple of things what are the disputes that arise from the contract that will be referred to arbitration generally the the arbitrator is governed by the contract between the parties so his scope or of jurisdiction or power is limited by what the parties have contractually given to the arbitrator so the scope generally unless you specifically want to exclude some particular dispute from arbitration it should be quite wide so for instance all claims disputes and uh, differences arising under the contract shall be referred to arbitration that makes it very wide second particularly from the point of view of a cross border transaction what is the underlying governing law of the contract so to take again the example of a contract between a german company and an indian company how will the dispute be decided under what law so always mention the governing law of the contract now why these kind of why we say include these kind of provisions is a general statement to say that your contract and this is whether you are talking about arbitration or you are talking about specifications for supply of a particular product 
it needs to be as clear as possible if there is ambiguity that ambiguity will in case of a dispute will lead to argument and that argument is going to cost time effort and costs in having it decided by the tribunal or the court so for instance going back to this point if there is a german company indian company contract between the two say it is for supply of goods to a third country you have then three different laws which could perhaps arise and which have connection to the dispute at hand and you will then find that whether it is a court or whether it is an arbitral tribunal you will be arguing about which substantive law the dispute should be decided under so a general rule in any kind of contract is be as clear as possible and avoid any kind of ambiguity uh the third thing that a, uh, an arbitration agreement should include is the seat of the arbitration which is both the geographical and legal location where the arbitration is seated and why that is important and we'll deal with it in a little detail later is that it determines the law by which the proceedings will be governed so for instance if it is seated in india your arbitration will be governed by the arbitration and conciliation act and indian law and indian courts will exercise supervisory jurisdiction so say for instance if you want interim relief the in indian courts will have jurisdiction to grant such relief most importantly if the award is being challenged it is the courts of the seat which will have jurisdiction next slide please um the fourth thing is the governing law of the arbitration now i mentioned that the law of the seat will generally govern the arbitration so this is the governing law of the arbitration agreement now this is not something necessary if you have the law that governs your contract so say indian law governs your contract but your arbitration is seated in germany for instance that means that german courts will be will have jurisdiction to decide any challenge to the award number of arbitrators you should also mention that in a simple low value transaction a sole arbitrator may be appointed if it is a cross border transaction it's extremely complicated you may opt for a three member tribunal the difference is that for a sole arbitrator either parties consent to the appointment of the arbitrator or the court or an institution appoints the arbitrator whereas if it's a three member tribunal each party is able to appoint its own arbitrator and then the two arbitrators appoint the third so you get more choice in that kind of uh, formulation you can if you want also include a reference to the qualifications of arbitrators but that is only if the transaction or the contract is particularly technical or special expertise or knowledge is required and you could also mention the nationality say if you are appointing a if the parties are agreeing to a sole arbitrator they can say that the sole arbitrator shall not be of a nationality of either the of either of the parties and may be from a neutral jurisdiction uh next slide please okay now i briefly touched upon the seat of arbitration this is extremely important because as i said this is the place where the arbitration is conducted and that is not just geographically but it is a geographical and also a legal jurisdiction to which the arbitration is tied and it determines the law and the courts which will have supervisory jurisdiction over the arbitration now why is it important to select a seat and that is because i think the biggest there are two main considerations it is to consider the arbitration regime within that jurisdiction 
and how supportive the courts are of arbitrations. So you don't want a jurisdiction where courts interfere with the arbitral process or with arbitral awards. As I said, the difference between arbitration and litigation is that there are limited grounds for challenge to an award. Therefore, it is quicker, there is more certainty and it is easier to enforce an award. So you want to choose a seat where you know the courts are pro-arbitration and will not interfere. Now, I mentioned, as you will see, I mentioned that the seat has a geographical and legal connotation. So while you may choose, for instance, the seat, say you say the seat of the arbitration will be Mumbai, India. But for some hearings, say you have a German witness, you can also have the hearing itself in Germany. And that is the venue. It will not change the seat of the arbitration. The seat will continue to remain Mumbai, India. But for the sake of convenience of the parties, you can have the venue of the particular hearing anywhere in the world. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I said, an Indian seat, it will be governed by part one of the act and it will be subject to the jurisdiction of Indian courts. Uh, any award coming out of an arbitration with an Indian seat will be deemed to be a domestic award. And that is whether the parties are purely Indian entities or it is what is referred to as an international commercial arbitration where one of the parties are foreign entities. There is a timeline for completing the arbitration for a purely domestic transaction or a purely domestic dispute, but this is not the case for an international commercial arbitration. Now, if there is a foreign seat, you still have, and I think this is the most important, one of the most important amendments that the government brought into effect in 2015, which is that interim relief is available from Indian courts even if the seat is outside India. So even for instance, if you have a German seat, you will be entitled to come to an Indian court for interim relief. And the reason for that, why that is really important, and Jeet will touch upon it uh, shortly, is that interim orders of foreign courts or tribunals are not enforceable in India. So if you need an injunction, if you need some securities, it is worthwhile coming to an Indian court for relief, even though the arbitration may be seated outside. Uh, secondly, after you have received your award, if there are assets in India, if the respondent is in India, you can enforce the foreign award in India under the New York Convention. Uh, a recent judgment which was very important was that two Indian parties are also free to choose a foreign seat of arbitration. Now, I'm not weighing into the logic or any kind of recommendation on why two Indian parties would choose a foreign seat. If everything is based in India, it would be logical to have an Indian seat, but this becomes relevant particularly to multinational companies who may have wholly owned subsidiaries in India and may therefore prefer to have a foreign seat of arbitration. So this was a path-breaking judgment that the Supreme Court passed in April this year. Um, last thing and most importantly is from the Indian context, if you are choosing a foreign seat of arbitration, you must ensure that the seat is in a reciprocating territory, that is a country that has a signatory to the New York Convention. And additionally, that the Indian government has notified it in the official gazette as a reciprocating territory. So out of 150 countries which have actually signed the New York Convention, the 
uh, the Indian government has actually, no, sorry, I don't think it's 150, I think we've gone to 168 or 169 countries. Uh, the Indian government has, however, notified only 50. Now, Germany is notified as a reciprocating territory and it is a signatory to the New York Convention. But for instance, just to take an example, Vietnam, with whom uh, Indians have a lot of trade, is a signatory to the New York Convention, but it has not been notified by the Indian government. And that means that if the arbitration is seated in Vietnam, that award may not be enforceable in India. So this is something that you must keep in mind at the time of drafting your arbitration clause and choosing that seat of arbitration. Next slide, please. Um, I think uh, we can skip that where I'm, I've taken way too long. I've just touched upon Indian foreign seat. Um, Jeet, and I think I can now hand it over to you on whether all disputes can be arbitrated. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks, Shani. Right, so um, we've now seen how, um, how an arbitration agreement is entered into and what the requirements are. But does that mean that every dispute for which there is an arbitration agreement uh, can be subject to arbitration? And that's where we come to the concept of what is known as arbitrability. Uh, there are certain disputes which have a very public character to them. For instance, criminal cases or testamentary disputes, these affect the public at large. Uh, for a crime such as murder, it is usually the state which is prosecuting. Uh, and it's not purely a dispute between two private parties. So disputes that uh, take a public character may not be arbitrable. And therefore, under the Arbitration Act, um, there is a distinction between those disputes that can be taken to arbitration and those that can't. Now, strangely, for a concept which is as fundamental as this, the Arbitration Act does not specify uh, a list of disputes which are arbitrable and which are not. And so these have really have to be culled from various cases that have come up before Indian courts. And Indian courts have over a period of time come down to uh, a three-step test to decide which disputes are arbitrable and which ones are not. So those disputes which affect rights in REM, which means rights that affect the world at large, are deemed to be non-arbitrable because um, there are third parties who may not be a party to the arbitration agreement who may also have an interest in the outcome of the dispute. So, so a good example of this is ownership of a patent. If somebody claims a patent, um, it is open for anybody uh, in the world to say that this is not patentable because they've made the same invention before. And that dispute ought not to be arbitrable because there might be other such people who might claim the same thing. And therefore, the ownership of a patent uh, ought to be a public proceeding. On the other hand, there are rights which are in personam, which only affect the parties um, that are at dispute. Now, these typically arise out of out of contracts. Usually, you know, contracts for sale of goods or services. These are usually in in personam rights, and because they only affect the two parties to the contract, uh, disputes arising out of such rights have been deemed to be arbitrable. Now, in a very famous case, which is the Booz Allen case, the Supreme Court applied this test to identify six categories of disputes, which it said would not be arbitrable. And those were criminal matters, matrimonial disputes, tenancy cases, testamentary cases, insolvency cases, and guardianship disputes. So um, applying this test, the Supreme Court has identified these six areas, which are per se non-arbitrable. However, it has also said that this is not some exhaustive list. On a case-to-case -case basis, it will decide whether or not a dispute is arbitrable or it is not. Um, now, one interesting point that comes up here is there is a third category of rights, which are subordinate rights in personam that arise from rights in REM. Now, what does that mean? So if, if A has a patent to a certain invention, but A was to give, that, give the right to exploit that patent to B, and B was to go beyond the terms of that agreement. Now that would be a right that arises from A's patent right, which is a right in REM. But the right, uh, but, the, but the contract between A and B gives rise to a set of rights that are in personam. And so courts have held that such rights, which are in personam rights, arising out of in REM rights, can be arbitrable. 
Now, unfortunately, this is not completely settled because different high courts in India have taken different positions on this. But I think it's safe to say that this is the trend the world over and uh, India will soon probably go in the same direction and allow arbitration for in personam rights that arise from in rem rights. Uh, we'll, we'll just deal with a couple of specific instances now. One is uh, the arbitration of fraud. So Indian courts earlier had the position that any dispute that had allegations of fraud was non-arbitrable. That has now been uh, reduced. It, it, it has been narrowed down and courts have now held that merely an allegation of fraud does not make an arbitration, uh, does not make a dispute non-arbitrable. Uh, the allegation must be serious. It must go to the root of the arbitration agreement and it must take a color of a criminal proceeding in order for it to become non-arbitrable. For IPR disputes, as we just discussed, uh, there are various decisions from different high courts um, and the position is as yet unsettled, but the trend seems to be towards allowing for in personam rights arising from in rem IPR rights to be made arbitrable. In Germany specifically, um, there is an interesting development. So Germany uh, also has a similar conundrum as India. Um, they have bifurcated between patent validity proceedings and infringement proceedings. And patent validity proceedings are subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of a federal patent court. So those seem not to be arbitrable, but infringement claims can be arbitrable. I think German courts have used the test of pecuniary interest. So wherever they've found a pecuniary interest or a money claim, they've held that uh, such disputes could be arbitrable, but where they don't find a pecuniary interest, they've usually held that uh, IPR disputes are not arbitrable. All right, we now deal with uh, the very important concept of interim relief. So in case if there's a dispute between two parties, usually uh, parties want to protect their rights pending the completion of these proceedings that they've initiated, whether that's uh, proceedings before a court or proceedings in arbitration. And um, the Indian Arbitration Act has identified several provisions that deal with what reliefs can be granted, who can grant such reliefs and when such reliefs can be granted. So the most important provision for that is, first of all, Section 9 of the Act. Uh, this is available for domestic arbitrations and for foreign seated arbitrations that commence after October 23rd, 2015. Uh, this, as Shanin explained, in 2015, the Indian Arbitration Act was amended uh, and Section 9 was made applicable even to arbitrations that were seated outside of India. So after that date, it, it is available for arbitration seated outside of India and it is always available for arbitration seated in India or for domestic arbitrations, as they're called. Um, now, uh, the you can you can go to an Indian court uh, prior to the commencement of arbitration, during the ongoing arbitration, and even after an arbitration until the award is enforced. So you can have recourse to Section Nine throughout the throughout the dispute until such time as the award is enforced. But once the tribunal is constituted, uh, parties are required to bring their interim relief applications to the tribunal. They cannot then go to a court. This was a change that was brought in pursuant to the 2019 uh, amendment to the Indian Arbitration Act because there was a, uh, sorry, pursuant to the 2015 amendment because there was a lot of chaos where parties would try getting relief before a court. If they didn't, they would go to the tribunal and vice versa. So in order to streamline that, uh, what has now been provided is that if the arbitration has not commenced, you can go to a court. If you get relief from a court, you have to commence arbitration within 90 days of getting your interim relief. Once the arbitration tribunal is constituted, you have to go and seek interim relief before the tribunal under Section 17 of the Arbitration Act. And the only circumstance in which you can go to a court, despite there being an arbitration tribunal in place, is if the court comes to a finding that the tribunal will not be able to give you the same efficacious remedy that you could get from a court. So one example of this is, you know, in, in, in the Bhuvneshwar Expressways case where uh, the arbitral tribunal was in place, but one of the arbitrators had recused themselves. Uh, the court held that because the tribunal was not completely constituted, it would not be able to give the relief. And the court therefore agreed to give relief under Section 9, even though the tribunal was already in place. Now, the last category of uh, interim relief um, 
that you can get is from an emergency arbitrator. This is a new uh, trend that we are seeing. Most institutions now have provisions for emergency arbitrator. Emergency arbitrator is supposed to be a substitute for section nine. So it entitles parties to get relief from an arbitrator even before the main tribunal is constituted for the main proceedings. The emergency arbitrator operates almost like a section nine court, but he's an arbitrator and not a court. And uh, the, the benefit of this is that uh, oftentimes for international disputes, uh, it would be difficult for parties to perhaps uh, convince a local court or if uh, you know the uh, foreign law elements are 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 involved, a judge in a particular country may not completely be aware of it. Whereas an emergency arbitrator is likely to have uh, transnational experience and would therefore be better suited to actually give such relief. Now, what kind of interim relief can be granted? This is set out under the Act. Uh, one of the things that has now been done uh, pursuant to the amendment is that both the arbitral tribunal and the Section 9 court are empowered to give uh, the same set of reliefs. So it's not as if parties are at a disadvantage if they go to one or the other. And the kinds of reliefs that can be granted are uh, for the preservation, custody, and sale of the subject matter of the dispute. This is usually in the form of uh, attachment of property, which is a notional seizing of the property by an arbitrator um, or the sale of goods of, uh, of, of a party if the goods are perishable. Um, the other kind of relief is injunction or a status quo order. So an order which restrains the parties from not doing certain acts uh, until the completion of the proceedings. It's usually used as a substitute for attachment uh, and, it, and it maintains the status quo. Uh, this is also a very common order that you see in bank guarantee disputes where one party wants to invoke the guarantee and the other party wants to stop the invocation and until uh, the dispute is heard the court usually asks parties to maintain status quo um, a third kind of remedy is the appointment of a receiver or a person who will look after and manage the property and other aspects uh, pending the outcome of the dispute between the parties this is very common in property disputes uh, and a fourth kind of remedy is securing the amount in dispute, which is usually by posting a security or a solvent security, usually as a bank guarantee or a deposit of monies, so that uh, in case if after the proceedings are complete and one party wins, uh, the other party should not be able to say, sorry, I, I have no money left with me now. So at the very outset, a court or a tribunal can say, please deposit the monies. And once the matter is complete, we will use these monies to satisfy the award. But this is tough to get. It's not always granted. It's 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 a very high threshold, uh, and so one must think through whether or not you are actually able to make out a case to get this relief. Um, and then, of course, there are a whole set of other orders that courts and tribunals are empowered to grant, such as inspection of books, accounts, property, uh, disclosure, things like that. Uh, these are fairly common, not hard to get, but of course, uh, you know, you would have to make out a good case for it. Um, Right, so that brings us now to the enforcement of different kinds of interim awards and orders. Um, interim awards, so under the Arbitration Act, um, the definition of arbitral award includes an interim award. And, uh, but, but this is restricted to part one of the act. So uh, the definition of, of an award is included in part one of the act, as a result of which domestic interim awards are enforceable under part one of the Arbitration Act. But, foreign awards that are governed by part two, uh, they may not be enforceable unless they finally settle a matter between the parties which is at issue. Uh, this has also been you know, uh, held in, in, in multiple case laws. So it's important if you're seeking interim relief, it's important to bear in mind whether that relief will actually be enforceable in India or not, if, especially if it's coming from a part two foreign seated arbitration. For emergency awards, um, many of you may have heard of the recent Amazon future dispute. Um, there is no statutory recognition for emergency, uh, uh, for emergency arbitration and emergency awards under the Arbitration Act. But the Delhi High Court recently enforced the emergency award in the Amazon future dispute. Of course, this has now been taken to the Supreme Court and the Delhi High Court order has been stayed. Um, but I think it's likely that the Supreme Court will grant recognition to emergency arbitrations uh, given how common they've become. Uh, for foreign emergency arbitrations, um, 
the position is as yet unsettled. Different views have been taken by the Bombay and the Delhi High Court. So once again, because of the fact that they may not finally settle issues between the parties, they may not always be enforceable. But the Bombay High Court has taken the view that one can always file a Section 9 proceeding seeking the same reliefs that were sought in the emergency arbitration and those reliefs would be granted. The Bombay High Court has done that in a couple of cases. And so while there is no direct recognition of an emergency award that emanates from a part two arbitration, uh, indirectly the Bombay High Court has recognized such awards. On the other hand, the Delhi High Court has not. And so of course there is this, uh, there remains this difference in views between the Bombay and the Delhi High Court. And we will have to wait to see how the Supreme Court weighs in on this uh, when a matter reaches it in involving a part two emergency award. Finally, we come to interim orders. Um, interim orders by an Indian court, these are, as we discussed, they are available even before the commencement of arbitration and until um, the award is enforced under Section 9. Uh, interim orders by a foreign court are not enforceable um, because for the same reason that they do not finally decide a dispute between the parties and there's a requirement under the Civil Procedure Code that they must be rendered on the merits and finally decide a case between the parties. So. Uh, interim orders of foreign courts remain uh, something that are not uh, easily enforceable. The usual route is to sue upon them in a separate proceeding in India, which uh, usually defeats the very purpose of getting them. Germany, uh, you, you know, since uh, since many of the audience members might be from Germany, Germany has not been notified as a reciprocating territory under India's civil procedure code. So orders emanating from German courts are not currently enforceable in India as decrees. There are a bunch of countries that have been notified as reciprocating territories. The benefit of this is orders that, that emanate from courts in these jurisdictions, superior courts in these jurisdictions are enforceable as decrees. So one doesn't need to sue on those orders all over again, uh, but that's not the case for Germany. Uh, and I think that is something that perhaps the Indian government will try and correct yeah, in the times to come. Right, so I think um, I would hand over back to Shanin on the next set of slides. Thanks, Jeet. So just one thing to point out on uh, what Jeet mentioned about uh, recognition of foreign orders, uh, foreign judgments and decrees. Um, just to tell you that the countries that have been notified as reciprocating territories are largely Commonwealth countries. So I think there's a list of about 12 or 13. So by and large, most jurisdictions across the world, you would have to file a suit for enforcement of the judgment, which is again then one more reason why in cross-border transactions, arbitration attains more finality and is so important. Now, I know that we are running uh, short of time, so I am going to run through the last few slides very quickly so that I can try and take some questions. Um, we will send you a copy of the presentation, so for those of you who would like a copy of the presentation, please do write into the IGCC and uh, we'll be happy to share it with you. So the main, uh, the main thing to keep in mind between domestic awards, that is awards seated in India and passed in India and foreign awards is that domestic awards are enforceable <clears throat> immediately as decrees of the court. Now the timeline in which you must file an application to set aside an award before an Indian court, that is three months, which can be extended. Now, unless the mere filing of an application to challenge the award does not mean that the award is stayed, that award can continue to be executed. And the party who is filing the application must then make a separate application for stay. Now, prior to the 2015 amendment, effectively there was an automatic stay. And what the judgment debtor, or sorry, the award debtor would do 
is file a challenge and take it through long drawn out court proceedings and the claimant would very often be so frustrated that they would, the parties would settle and what would happen is that the defendant would be rewarded for this set aside application because the plaintiff would agree the claimant would agree to a 10% or a 20% haircut but now no realizing that this is exactly what defendants were doing now there is no automatic stay and the party challenging the award must apply for a stay of the award and the stay will be granted by a court on such conditions as may be deemed fit and that is usually or almost always depositing the award amount in court with the court registrar or furnishing a security which is less common now what happens when the when the challenger deposits the money in court the claimant is entitled to withdraw that money on first furnishing a bank guarantee so therefore the defendant maintains his challenge but the claimant gets the benefit of the money in his pocket immediately and what this then does is discourages frivolous applications because the defendant is already out of pocket and there is then no hope of a separate settlement which was what used to happen earlier so that i think is the most important things in in terms of whether you want to choose an indian seat or a foreign seat of arbitration uh having said that the a recent amendment is that a, a stay will be granted on enforcement if the court prima facie which means on the face of it finds that the underlying contract which means the substantive transaction or contract which led to the dispute or the arbitration agreement which means the arbitration clause itself was induced by fraud or corruption so a dispute that has arisen because the uh, the defendant said says no 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 this uh, this claim is fraudulent does not fall within the purview of this it is only the entirety of the contract being induced by fraud or corruption that will lead the court to grant a stay of the award uh, next so uh, very quickly i i really am not going to run through these the grounds of challenge to domestic awards and the grounds on which foreign awards will be refused to be enforced are similar and, but they are very narrow if you look at the grounds of challenge over here you will see that there is no reevaluation or review of the award on the merits or the manner in which the arbitrator interpreted the facts or dealt with the facts it's very narrow grounds as opposed to what you would see in a first appeal against a judgment in any jurisdiction and that is another reason that arbitral awards achieve finality and in commercial transactions arbitration is so common one point to keep in mind is that where the arbitration is seated in india and is between only indian parties there is one additional ground of challenge which is that the award was patently illegal this is not available if the arbitration was an international commercial arbitration i e one of the parties was a foreign entity um next slide actually i think we can skip the public policy uh, slides and i think we can go to the end i've covered patent illegality because we're already now out of time um jeet do you want to perhaps just pick up the questions that we have there in the um, in the chat box sure shani jeet yeah i'll just uh, i'll just read them out um we can run through them yeah so i think this is one arbitral award not honored by the defendant within 19 days 
not even file appeal before the court within 30 days or expiry of 90 days. Plaintiff wants to go for execution of award. How to go about an enforcement of deemed decree? If in the meanwhile appeal is admitted by the court challenging the award, please suggest how to address the issue. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, a party challenging the award has to make a formal application for stay. If there is no challenge to the award, parties can go for enforcement by filing an execution petition. If during the course of the execution petition, the uh, defendant to the arbitration does file a challenge, he or she will still have to apply for a stay of, a stay of the award, failing which that execution will continue. But practically what will happen is that the execution will continue. The party challenging the award will have to ask for a stay at which point of time, if a stay is given, he will have to deposit the relevant amount in court and the award creditor will be entitled to withdraw it. Okay, I think the next um, one okay. is a civil proceeding or can it be a criminal proceeding? Ajit, why don't you answer? Yeah, I think, you know, so uh, criminal proceedings have to be taken to a criminal court. Um, criminal proceedings are per se non-arbitrable. Okay, uh, we, we can go to the next one. Does the absence of governing law in the contract presuppose that the law of the seat will be taken as the governing law? Good question. Jeet, do you want to take that or shall I? Uh, I think, I mean, uh, Shanin, um, look, I, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, the, sure. the answer, the answer really is that it depends. Uh, the choosing of a seat is one of the uh, factors that will be taken into account. Uh, there is a, there is some ambiguity in Indian law on this point. Uh, one looks at what is referred to as the closest connection test. What is the closest connect? What is the law that has the closest connection to the parties and to the dispute? And so you look at the various factors that go into it. Where are the parties uh, seated? Where is the contract to be performed? And in that, where have the parties chosen the seat of the arbitration to be? All of these will be taken into account. But yes, if there is no, if there is no other connection, yes, you could say that the choice of the seat will be deemed to be the choice of the governing law of the substantive contract. Okay. The um, lawyer has obviously asked that question. <laughs> okay, the next question, uh, which comes, I think, from your GEPSL Keshanin is, can two Indian parties agree to a foreign law for a contract being executed in India? Ah, so Justice Nariman has almost gone there to suggest that this is possible, but not quite. And that will still be. So while I think it is clear that you can have a foreign seat, I think it is clear that you can also have a foreign law governing the arbitration itself or the arbitration agreement to have a foreign substantive law that does not as yet seem to have been completely signed off by the Supreme Court. And while the GEPASL judgment can be interpreted in that manner, I think it would be still risky to do that. I can see an Indian court saying that Indian parties are not entitled to completely contract out of Indian law. So I've not given you a yes or no answer. I'm giving you the answer of it being ambiguous, but it being a risky choice to make. Okay, yeah, from this, from the same, uh, from the same case, Shanin, 
if if the parties I are india let's wrap it up also because i think where i'm seeing the attendees dropping i think they've uh, had their fill so uh, last question i think sabina before we hand it back to you sure chief you can yeah. choose one more question yeah so so we'll take this one if the parties are indian the arbitration award is issued outside of india uh, can a party refuse to agree to the award on the basis that it was issued outside india no so that award will still be enforceable however one thing to keep in mind is that the award should have been issued from a seat which is a signatory to the new york convention and also which has been notified as a reciprocating territory by the indian government if so and it passes the other parameters it will still be enforceable just because it is in a foreign seat will not affect it okay i think uh, i mean there Thanks, are a couple Sabina, of... I, I think okay uh, sure sana we are going to share uh, the questions with the speakers right so the yes. remaining ones which yes. are not to answer yeah all the other questions that we could not take up today we'll share them with the speakers and the speakers would definitely get back to them over email right shani and jeet yes sure perfect all right uh, yes sabina you can proceed with the vote of thanks okay <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, to both speakers for the excellent and hands-on presentation. It was very enlightening listening to you, and I'm sure, I mean, you can see from the number of questions that have come in uh, that the audience was engaged, and uh, it's relevant for them. Thank you so much, and also thank you for the audience for your patient hearing on this topic. Thank you to my colleagues, Sana Bhaktadi and Hani Mehta in the background who have managed everything so well. And uh, yes, and please do uh, contact us if you have any questions. You can also see the uh, contact details of Shanin on the slide and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. And Thank we will you also share for Jeet and me. Sorry, just to <laughs> say thank you. Thank you for your patience. We enjoyed this. And uh, of course, please keep the questions coming and reach out to us uh, if we can at all be of any assistance. Thank you. And we will also share the presentation with everyone who attended the session today because we're getting a lot of questions still that will we get the presentation. So yes, it will be shared with everybody who registered for the session today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.